Let's discuss placement of a root form implant in a maxillary bicuspid space with limited vertical bone and then bone grafting of a dehiscence following placement of the implant. In a painless and profound injection, this gentleman had been without this second bicuspid tooth for many years. We, we can't place an implant in the first molar position without a sinus lift and bone graft, but the second bicuspid graft is going to greatly enhance his chewing ability and aesthetics. So this is the incision, and you always want to make the mesial distal aspect of the incision toward the palatal so you can reflect the tissue to the buckle and then you can retract it. You don't want to ever make the mesial distal incision down the center of where the root, where the implant will be or down the center of the tooth because then you have to reflect two flaps. You only want to reflect one flap so you can hold that flap while you place the implant. You don't want to have to be holding or retracting a flap to the palatal. So I'll show you how to do that. So this is a releasing incision into the non-keratinized or unattached gingiva. And this is the distal releasing incision. You can see here's the line between the attached and the unattached gingiva. And I'm extending the flap, the incision into the unattached, non-keratinized gingiva, cutting into the sulcus on the distal of the first bicuspid. And then see where I've made this mesial to distal incision on the palatal side of the implant placement site, and I'm going to reflect the entire flap this way. What you don't want to do is make your incision right down the center of the, of the site so that you have to reflect half of it this way and half of it this way. That's a pain, and you don't want to do that. So take your time using a periosteal elevator. See, I'm reflecting the whole flap to the buckle side. Now in this case I don't have a cone beam. Standard of care is either a pano and a lateral ceph or a cone beam. So I've got a pano and a lateral ceph. Very simple, inexpensive radiographs. And then I'm going to show you how to supplement that with periapical radiographs of a pilot drill to determine the implant depth, your working depth. So see I've reflected this from the palatal to the buckle and exposed the alveolar crest. Now the alveolar crest was a bit knife-edged. I don't want to remove much of the alveolar crest, but I do want to flatten it a bit so I'm placing the implant into a flat surface and not a knife-edged ridge. And this is just a coarse diamond football with lots of water, light pressure. And see, I'm not removing much, I'm just flattening it just a bit. If you've got a knife edge ridge, then all the threads will be exposed on both the palatal and the buckle. So I want to take the ridge down just a little bit just to flatten it so that I can contain most of the threads in the bone and not have to, uh, to, to bone graft so much. Preoperatively, I've got, after I've done the adjustment of the alveolar crest, I've got 7.37 millimeters of bone from the alveolar crest to the floor of the sinus. Now I'm going to show you an article and talk a little bit about the issues with placement of the tip of either a root form or a small diameter implant into the sinus. We're going to talk about those at the end of this presentation. So I know I'm going to place the implant a bit into the sinus. But the bone in the floor of the sinus is very dense and that's nice stabilizing bone. So bottom line is don't worry about placing an implant just a bit into the floor of the sinus. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So here's my pilot drill and this is the dentist system. I'm not paid by dentists. I don't have any tie to them other than I really like this system and you will too because 
each of these drills has a shoulder. See, say, say it was a 12 millimeter implant. I start with the pilot drill, then go to the 2.2, 2.8, 3.7, 4.1, 4.3, 4.8, 4.8 millimeter in diameter drill, but each of them has a shoulder at this specific depth. So this one would have a shoulder at 12 millimeters. So once you've determined your depth, it's so easy to drill the rest of the osteotomies because you put that particular width drill into the, the handpiece and just drill into the bone until the shoulder contacts the alveolar crest. So easy. I hate those spinning silver drills that so many implant systems have with just black lines on them. You can't see those black lines. When there's water, the drill spinning, lights, this way it's perfectly accurate. Every width in diameter drill goes to exactly the same depth. So I really like this system. There may be another one like it. I don't know about it. So this is the pilot drill. Now I'm, I'm going to determine my depth with the pilot drill. Notice I already took a measurement using my DEXIS X-ray application to have a pretty close idea of the distance from the alveolar crest to the floor of the sinus. But I'm going to confirm the depth with the pilot drill and this is just an endo stopper. So you'll remember the measurement was almost eight millimeters. So this is 10 millimeters and I'm going to orient this at the exact location where I want the implant to be placed and I want to line it up along the line, the long axis of this bicuspid tooth. So you can see the pilot drill is in the bone to the endo stopper and that's about 10 millimeters. Then I'm going to take a periapical radiograph of the pilot drill in the bone with the rubber stopper and that's going to show me how far I am into the maxillary sinus and that's just about perfect. So I'm going to use 10 millimeter DEXIS drills. I'm going to start with the 2.2 go right into the pilot hole, into the pilot osteotomy, and be sure to keep this aligned with the bicuspid tooth, with the long axis and also uh, with the palatal facial alignment of this tooth. Now you can use a surgical guide if you want to. Many times in these single tooth situations I don't because then I can place it right where the, the uh, ideal bone is. So I'm going to go down, I'm going to sink it slowly, lots of water, up and down motion to the shoulder. See, and there's the shoulder contacting the alveolar crest. And just one, bur one drill after the other, go to the 2.8 next. Very efficient. Just be sure you keep this in alignment with the bicuspid tooth. Lots of water, light pressure, 3.7. See, and because this ridge was rather narrow, you can see the dehiscence is starting to form here. I'm starting to lose this bone on the buccal side of the facial side of the implant, so I know I'm going to need to bone graft that in just a moment. So I'm going down to the shoulder, okay? Now here's our osteotomy site. So select the proper implant, hand tighten, and then I'm going to use the ratchet wrench, and in a perfect world, we screw the implant in to 37 newton millimeters, newton centimeters of pressure. Use the ratchet wrench, see there's 37 newton centimeters, and we were able to screw the implant in with that pressure when it was screwed to place. So you can see we've got this dehiscence right here, removing any of the soft tissue, so I'm going to bone graft that dehiscence. See the rest of the implant is just slightly apical to the alveolar crest. Just wiping that with Perigard just to clean it real well. Now this is a 330 carbide burr and what I'm doing is I'm making holes in the cortical bone and I'm making pretty good size holes. Be sure you don't hit the tooth or anterior to the implant or adjacent to the implant or the uh, implant with the carbide burr. But I'm going through the cortical bone 
into the cancellus slash trabecular slash spongy bone. The spongy bone is where the blood supply comes from. And so if you just place the, imp the bone graft on the surface of the cortical bone, but you don't penetrate into the trabecular bone where the blood supply is, the bone graft is probably not going to work. So I want to make some pretty good holes through the cortical bone into the trabecular bone, the inner trabecular bone. You'll see the bleeding points. See the blood coming out of the trabecular bone. That's what supplies your bone graft with blood and makes it successful. So that's the healing cap it's reflecting a little bit further into the non-keratinized unattached gingiva because I want to pull the flap completely over the bone graft in the implant and the membrane once I'm finished. You can see the bleeding points here where I perforated the cortical plate. So be sure you've reflected to the unattached non-keratinized gingiva so you can pull the flap with very little pressure over the, the uh, implant once you've finished the bone grafting and place the membrane. There's just a few more holes in make. You know, be sure you penetrate into the spongy bone. And those are pretty good sized bone. Now this is bioos, freeze dried, cancellous bone the small particle size, and then this is a Dynamatrix resorbable collagen membrane. Now when you're selecting these membranes, be sure you select a membrane that's not like a starch shirt. You want a membrane that w that's malleable and once it gets wet it will adhere to the bone graft. There's nothing worse than working with a starch shirt or real stiff membrane. You can't make it conform to the bone graft, so this is a very good one. There are a lot of them, but be sure you get one that will adapt once it's wet. So I'm trimming this. I want to cover all the bone grafts. The purpose of the membrane, it gives the bone a head start on the soft tissue. If you don't place a membrane, the soft tissue grows faster than bone, and the soft tissue will grow into that mo bone graft material, and you won't, uh, it won't turn into bone. It'll be uh, soft tissue. So you want to give the bone graft, the bo I mean, you want to give the bone a head start, and that's what that membrane does. It keeps the soft tissue out of the bone graft for about three months. See, so you can see I've completely covered the dehiscence over the implant. Then I'm suturing with gut suture. These are interrupted sutures. So we've sutured this snugly. You can see there's no pressure. There's no blanching on the the surgical site, you want to take a deep bite with your suture. You don't want to just barely go through the edges. You want to go far into the uh, flap and the adjacent t and the tissue you're suturing to so that the suture does not pull through. See how far I am into the flap and into the tissue I'm suturing into. And here's the implant about two millimeters into the floor of the sinus. Now, when we first started doing this, I was really worried about placing an implant into the floor of the sinus years ago. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, litigation, sinus infections, things like this. But there are times that you need to go into the floor of the sinus. And I really like engaging this dense bone in the floor of the sinus. It really stabilizes that implant. So we had an, an oral surgeon was giving a presentation on all on four at my teaching center in Dallas, CARD, the Center for Aesthetic Restorative Dentistry. And I had talked to the oral surgeon for one of these dental supply, implant dental supply companies, and he was unsure, or he wouldn't make a, a, a statement and say, no, this is, this is, pro or this is good or this is bad. So this oral surgeon was presenting on all on four and oh my gosh, he was placing these implants through the sinus into the zygomatic arch on bilaterally on all these all on four implant cases. And I spoke with him and I said, is that a problem going through the sinus? He said, well, if it is, we're all in trouble because I do it every day. So then I started researching it more on my own and I'll show you the study right here. See, this is, this is one of many experimental study on penetration of dental implants into the maxillary sinus 
at different depths. So what it said was it's placing implants into the sinus at a depth of one millimeters, two millimeters, and three millimeters plus. The results were there are no signs of inflammatory reactions in any maxillary sinus of the eight dogs uh, used in the experiment. The tips of the implants with penetrating depths of one and two millimeters were found to be fully covered with newly formed membrane and partially with new bone. The tips of the implants with penetrating depths over three millimeters were exposed to in the sinus cavity and showed no membrane or bone coverage. No significant differences were found among groups regarding implant stability, bone to implant contact, and bone area in the implant threads. Conclusion, despite the protrusion extents, penetration of dental implants into the maxillary sinus with membrane perforation does not compromise the sinus health and the implant, implant osteointegration in canines. That's the Dental Minute.